You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for today's show is a real estate expert and managing principal of Avistone, Richard Kent. Avistone is a real estate investment management firm specializing in the acquisition and operation of multi tenant industrial properties nationwide. Founded in 2013, Avistone owns and operates more than 1.5 million square feet of industrial space in California, Georgia, Ohio, Texas, and Florida. The executive management team of Avistone has over 60 years of combined experience in acquisitions, structured finance, and asset management. Richard oversees Avistone's capital market operations and brings more than 30 years of experience in financial services, real estate investment, and capital markets to the company. Having completed transactions and commercial properties valued at more than $2 billion, Richard served as senior executive at auction.com prior to founding Avistone. Over the course of his career, Richard has held senior positions in the commercial real estate departments of Wall Street firms, commercial banks, and real estate operating firms. Now, I'm, I'm incredibly excited, guys, to peel back the layers of Richard's business and dive deep into Avistone and talk more about the, the overall success that they've had in the last couple of years since founding 2013. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items I want to run through with you guys. First off, as you guys know, if you've listened to this show on a regular basis, you know that uh, just like Richard, he invests in industrial business parks. We invest in mobile home parks today. So mobile home parks is our niche. That's our specialty. And I'm telling you this because we are actively seeking properties to purchase, mobile home parks to purchase, to add to our portfolio. And so if you're out there on the hunt, you're looking for opportunities and you run across any mobile home communities that are 60 plus spaces in size, and you're either looking to maybe flip it for a quick dollar or you're looking for a team to help you take down that deal please think of us. If you run across something you think that might be of interest to us and you'd like to discuss it in more detail, you can reach out to me directly, kevin at kevinbupp.com. That's my personal email address. Again, kevin at kevinbupp.com. Uh, next up, uh, you've probably also heard me talk over the last couple of months uh, about the investment arm of our company, which is Sunrise Capital Investors. And uh, again, Sunrise owns and operates mobile home parks throughout the eastern half of the U.S. And um, we actually partner with accredited investors just like yourself who are seeking passive investments and you know strong returns on your on your money. And I mention this only because we just recently closed out our, our very first successful Reg D 506C fund. And uh, we have had to reluctantly turn away a number of you had shown interest. Um, and for that, I just I want to apologize. See, I'm sorry. But uh, don't fret too much because we are currently in planning mode for our second mobile home park fund. And we anticipate launching that sometime the end of Q1 of 2018 or Q2. Okay. So just keep in the loop, stay listening to the show. But if you'd like, really the best way to stay up to date with all these notifications is just go to our website, sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And you can actually create a free account inside our investment portal. Okay. It's a secure investment portal. It takes like three minutes to open up that account. And then this will place you on the first to know list for when that second fund rolls out. And, and, uh, I, I promise you, based on the the demand we had for the first one, we're probably going to hit our subscription limits pretty quickly. So definitely get on that list. Make sure that you're the first to know, and uh, that way we'll get you on board the second time around. And lastly, guys, if you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, which is where I'm based out of, would love to meet you. If you find you have an extra minute or hour or whatever it is while you're in town, um, if we can coordinate our schedule, to love to, to buy you a drink, buy you a coffee, grab you lunch or whatever. Uh, you can, again, reach out to me directly, kevin at kevinbup.com. That's my personal email. And let's see if we can coordinate our time together. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome today's guest, Richard Kent, to the show. Richard, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I'm real excited to dive a little bit into into your business. Um, I you know gave my my spiel of your background, but I'm sure I didn't do you any justice. So if you could maybe take a few minutes, Richard, and tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself, your background, how you got into real estate. Okay. Well, by the way, I thought I thought you gave me a lot of justice. <laughs> um, you know, I started out in this business as a stockbroker. Okay. Uh, back in the late '70s, with Payne, Weber, Jackson, and Curtis. And the reason I became a stockbroker, and I hate to admit this, but while I was in college, 
uh, I was studying economics, and I saw the uh, the Thomas Crown Affair, the original Thomas mm. Crown Affair, where if anybody remembers that back that far, uh, Thomas Crown was a very successful international money arbitrageur, and you know he had different screens and different currencies, and it looked it looked pretty cool. So uh, that's what I studied uh, in college. So I became a stockbroker thinking that's an area I'd really like to get into. Mm-hmm. Well, because I started uh, in, in Orange County, where I'm from, um, I quickly discovered that we did not have any foreign currency trading going on in Orange County. But the one thing that we did have is that we had a lot of home building going on. Mm-hmm. And along with that home building uh, was the creation of mortgages. So you had mortgage bankers uh, taking mortgages from from home buyers and bundling them to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae's mm-hmm. and selling them into the capital markets to the Wall Street firms. So when I discovered that, uh, I started to shift my focus into mortgage-backed securities and hedging out interest rate risk in the financial futures markets. And that's pretty much how I started in this business because from Payne Weber, I went to Drexel Burnham. And there I was uh, in the mortgage markets and slowly began to learn the real estate business from studying the dynamics of how to make a mortgage loan. Hmm. Because in order to make a good mortgage loan, you have to have uh, a pretty good understanding of the underlying collateral. Mm-hmm. Well, when, when Drexel uh, you know, went through, it's, uh, you know, it was a great place to work, but you know, obviously it went out of business uh, in the late 80s with uh, the collapse of the junk bond market. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually had a joint venture uh, with a friend of mine from Drexel. So we did a lot of business with the coal company in Newport Beach, which, which was one of the large commercial property owners, uh, certainly in the John Wayne Airport area. And we started to do some mortgage business uh, with the coal company. And they re- I really did learn the dynamics of income properties from the people at coal. And the one lesson I really learned from them is that the old adage, location, 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 is important, but it's not necessarily the most important one when it comes to commercial real estate. Most important is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. (laughs) And second, timing, timing, Mm -hmm. timing. So in other words, when you look at any commercial property, and it doesn't matter whether it's a a mobile home park or it's a multi-tenant industrial property like we buy, Mm -hmm. you have to understand the bottom line cash flow dynamics of that property. And once you do, you could determine what the property is worth and you could determine how much debt it supports and you could determine how much of a return you could potentially pay your investors. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. So, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's the long and the short of it. Uh, now later, uh, you know, from Drexel, uh, you know, I was with uh, Solomon Smith Barney's in their commercial real estate department in New York City, making commercial loans all over the country, making conduit loans. And, uh, you know, later uh, I was with uh, Berkshire Mortgage, which became Deutsche Bank Berkshire Mortgage, making large Fannie Mae loans on apartments. So I had a very solid background, uh, really on the capital market, structured mm-hmm. finance and lending side of commercial real estate. When the market collapsed uh, almost 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to be hired along with one of my partners here at Avistone, Dan Culler, uh, to Auction.com. Hmm. And we were the first two executives at Auction.com to um, get the firm into the commercial space. The firm was, Auction.com was already huge in the residential auction market, uh, but we began the process of going into the commercial space and doing auctions online, which nobody had ever really done before. Hmm. Uh, there, uh, we were doing uh, not defaulted loans, foreclosed assets on the part of major banks. We did hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, transactions and auctions. But when the market started to turn about 2012, we could see it because we were seeing less and less distressed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, so at my age, you know, I probably have one more major rodeo of a bull market <laughs> in real estate, yeah. which is typically maybe 12 to 14 years. So we left there, we formed Avistone, and we started buying multi-tenant industrial parks. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Well, I pr- appreciate you sharing that background with us. And so it leads me to the next question. Uh, not necessarily the reason for forming Avistone, because you just really answered that there, but why industrial parks? Why that particular asset class? 
You know, um, you know, I, I noticed that you talked about mobile home parks, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of similarities actually between why we buy multi-tenant industrial to why you buy mobile home parks. Hmm. One of the biggest um, factors is that you literally cannot buy the type of flex property that that we buy, and and the reason is is you know we like to say we're, we're buying it way below replacement cost, but the reality is. Where are you going to find 20 acres of land along a major highway in Atlanta or Tampa or Columbus Hmm. and build this kind of property? There's no way you'd build this type of property. It's it's single-story concrete, and it takes a lot of acreage. You would build a high-rise hotel, multifamily, something. So just like mobile home parks, the land is so hard to find in infill locations that you just can't replace them today. Mm-hmm. So that creates a value. Okay. The second thing is that uh, you know we have a very simple business plan, very simple model. You know we buy properties in in dynamic markets with really low vacancy. So when you look at a market like Dallas or Tampa, Atlanta, you see a market with a multiple of economic drivers all kinds of different industries, lots of Fortune 100, certainly Fortune 500 companies. So if you have a product type that is not being built anymore and you have really low vacancy factors, uh, it makes it very hard for the tenants to move. Where are they going to move to? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that's very one of our major factors. Okay. The next thing is, is that we could still find, and I'm not going on wood here, but we've been able to find you know, properties that are stabilized. We're not taking lease-up risk. We're not taking a value-add risk. We're buying stabilized properties uh, that are generating an 8% cap rate that we're able to finance with 4%, 4.5% long-term debt. So we create a very significant arbitrage between cap rates and financing rates. Wow. That, very, that's been uh, okay. very helpful. But again, and we don't over leverage. Uh, we, so we, we're really concerned about risk reward ratios. So if we're buying projects below replacement cost, stabilized in dynamic type markets mm-hmm. that are generating strong cash flow, then our goal is to offer investors a really good uh, current rate of return. You know, mm-hmm. as high a yield as we can, and we've averaged anywhere from seven to nine percent cash on cash that we pay monthly. Mm-hmm. We're not looking to hit home runs uh, because we don't want to take you know huge value add risk. Mm-hmm. So if we could raise rents, say three to four percent a year, and we're paying an eight percent or seven percent cash on cash yield, and we pay our mortgage on time, which we do, which allows for a little bit of. Uh, uh, amortization, mm-hmm. you know, we target a mid teen IR and you kind of see how we get there. Uh, yeah. 8% cash on cash, 4%, per, uh, you know, rental increases. Um, so that, that's really the goal. And we believe that if you can consistently get a 12 to 60%, uh, internal rate of return where half of that money is coming from current yield, you have a very favorable risk reward ratio in markets that are tight in your well below replacement. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that, that's very attractive. Um, I want to ask you about the debt side of it. What kind you, you mentioned what kind of rates that you're, you're finding in the marketplace, but what does the overall debt structure look like on one of your typical acquisitions? Are these uh, CMBS type, uh, uh, type structures? Uh, yes. Yeah, no, we could qualify for bank debt, which is, as you know, it's typically shorter term. And bank debt... Uh, is a, is it has a good utility if you're doing a value add and you're sure. going to be in and out of a market in, in a short period of time. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I'm sorry for interrupting the show, but I have something super important that I wanted to share with you. I've been invited back for a second consecutive year as a presenter and panel moderator at the Best Ever Conference in Denver, hosted by Joe Fairless. Last year was an absolute blast, and the talent both on stage and in the room was nothing short of amazing, and this year that talent has been stepped up a notch. 
Being that you're a listener to my show, I'd like to extend an invite for you to come and join me this year. The event is February 9th and 10th in downtown Denver, and seats are very limited. Use offer code KEVIN, my name, K-E-V-I-N, to receive 10% discount off the price of admission. The early bird registration is limited, and I guarantee that this event will sell out, so grab your tickets while you can. To learn more and to register, go to besteverconference.com. Now, I'm positive that once you take a look at the speaker lineup that your mind will be made up and you'll be attending. And just to sweeten that pot a little bit, I'm going to be hosting a free real estate and mobile home park investing mastermind on Friday evening, free of charge for all who want to join. I did the same thing last year and it was a huge hit and I'd welcome the opportunity to meet with you and spend some time together to help you reach your real estate goals. If you want to partake in this mastermind session, you'll need to send me an email to kevin at kevinbupp.com and include proof of registration as well as your contact information. That way I will put you on the mastermind list. Again, go to besteverconference.com, use offer code KEVIN to receive a 10% discount off the price of admission, and I'll look forward to meeting you in February. Now back to the show. But one of the biggest risks that we see going forward, and certainly we see it going into the new year, uh, given the strong economy, is we wanted to hedge ourselves from increasing interest rates. Mm -hmm. So when we go into the CMBS market, you know, and we get we you know obtain ten year term mortgages with thirty year am several years of interest only. Mm-hmm. Uh, if a new buyer comes along, they can assume that loan, and that loan can be assumed multiple times over its ten year term. So mm-hmm. we've we've really locked in that rate. So let's say we're in a higher interest rate market in a couple of years, uh, thus that you know maybe you could get a mortgage for six and a half six and a half percent. A buyer of our property could assume a four and a quarter percent mortgage. Yeah, the mortgage itself is in the money. Yeah, the, the mortgage itself becomes part of the what I call the capital estate of the property. The overall so overall the value of that we, property. I mean, the overall value of that property has right. increased versus the same exact property if someone had to go out and get brand new debt put in place on it. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Yes. But going going back to your original question, why multi tenant industrial? You know, if you look at, there's a lot of there's a lot of wind at our back right now. Uh, the growth of the internet has been a huge uh, benefit to industrial properties. Everybody's familiar with the big box, Amazon, Costco, but a lot of our businesses are smaller, uh, you know, uh, businesses that may have a retail branch somewhere in a downtown location, but we have all their warehouse. So we, mm-hmm. so a lot of our tenants are the last spoke of that internet logistic uh, supply line. Mm-hmm. Um, it benefits from increased construction. So, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, when we're talking about a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure program in the next couple of years, where do the building trades set up? They set up in industrial properties. Mm-hmm. Where do home builders build uh, set up when they're building homes for a whole generation of millennials? It's in industrial properties. Coming revolution in 3D manufacturing, it'll be in industrial properties. Even robotics Mm -hmm. are going to take place in industrial properties. In fact, they'll even make robots in industrial properties. Sure. So we just see a lot of wind at our back in an asset class that they're just not building anymore of. Hmm. Very, very interesting. So we've, so, we've, we've, so we've tried to keep the secret for the last four years. <laughs> well, so you're telling we, it to it, thousands of now, people now. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Yeah. And believe me, Wall Street's figured it out. We, we have major institutions, you know, coming to us, looking to joint venture. Uh, yeah, it's pretty it, – the, the word's out there. And now, you know, with the tax, uh, the tax cut that was just announced, mm-hmm. you look at the spikes in small business optimism right now. It is the highest it's been since the early 1980s in mm-hmm. the Reagan years. Yep. And these small businesses, when they're optimistic, that's when they look to expand. And I don't know where they're going to expand to because you're not making any more of this type product. Mm-hmm. So we see very good pressure on, uh, on rents. Okay. So th- the big question I have is, is how do you find your strategic advantage as far as finding these, you know, what we would consider very strong opportunities? Uh, you know, you're, you're saying that you're actively buying at 8% cap rates, um, which is, is very favorable in today's marketplace. When you have a lot of the institutional guys that are perking their ears up and seeing that this is a, a viable space that they could 
potentially do really well in. Uh, obviously, their cost of capital, uh, you know, it could be a lot cheaper. Probably is a lot cheaper. Uh, they might not need as much of a of a yield premium that you guys are getting on your, you know, versus the debt uh, and, and the eight cap rate that you're buying that property on. So how are you guys able to stay competitive in the marketplace as far as the acquisitions are concerned? You know, that's a really good question. And I hate to give up all of our secret sauce. I'm going to try not to. <laughs> uh, so what we try to do is we try to stay anywhere in a purchase price on a single asset between 8 million and 20 million. Okay. Because in that zone, if you're under 20 million, you're typically under the institutional radar. Gotcha. Because you're right. When the institutions come in, they'll outbid everybody. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, we want to be a little bit higher in price than some of the local players could afford. Some of the you know single uh, 1031 mm-hmm. ex- exchange people. So we find now and. You know, we have more and more competition, but we find if we stay in that eight to twenty million dollar zone, then that eliminates you know all of the big players, eliminates some of the small players. Gotcha. Now that that said, you know we have a network of about twenty thousand real estate brokers, uh, you know, in our database. I, I, I'm pretty sure we see every deal in the market that that fits our bogies. You know, we may look at twenty to thirty deals before we bid on one of them in a best and final. And out of the ones we do bid in, we probably win one in six. Okay. So if, if it doesn't hit our return parameters for our investors, we will not chase it. Mm-hmm. So you just have to look at every – you have to target your markets that you mm-hmm. like. And then you, uh, you have to keep your discipline. You have to understand the numbers and the markets and the submarkets. And just bid it up to a level that you'd be more than happy to own it. And if it goes for more than that, just on to the next. Who, who do you find to be your typical seller? Who are you guys buying from? Who, who owns these properties today? Or a lot of times, is it the original developer that might have developed it 20 or 30 years ago? You know, that's another really good question. Uh, we have, there, there's really, I would say, there's really two categories of, of sellers that we have purchased from. The first category is those, um, you know, those sponsors that took a lot of risk in 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. and they bought these projects as distressed properties. Because as you know, when the market collapsed, uh, everything went down. Mm-hmm. So they were buying these type of projects, and they were probably 40 to 50% empty. So what would happen is their strategy uh, was they promised their investors a 30% return for buying distressed. And their strategy was that if you were a business and you walked in the door and you had a pulse and you could fog a mirror, you got a lease. (laughs) Boom. And so their strategy was to fill it up. And once they filled it up, then it was time for them to sell. Because when you promise your investors a 30% return, time is not your friend. You have to. Mm -hmm. So we would come, we come along and we're more than happy to buy it. And, you know, we don't really regard it as a value add, but what we needed to do, in, in, and we do it all the time, is we need to then clean up all the leases. You know, typically, these are three to five year leases, mm-hmm. which we really like because that means everything rolls, maybe 20 to 25% of the property rolls every year. And it gives us a chance to put everybody, make sure everybody's on a triple net, they have state of the art documents. Uh, but what we have noticed is those type of sellers, left? they left meat on the bone. I don't think we have bought a project in the last three to four years that did not appraise higher than the purchase price that we're buying it. Hmm. And that's very unusual in the lending market. And these were appraisals ordered by our lender. Right. Uh, so we go in, you know, we have a rent roll that's under market. We bring it to the market. We, you know, we, we typically will improve the roof. Because all these the properties that we buy were all built in the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of roof. When you're buying a hundred thousand sure. square foot property, that's two and a half acres of roof. And so we'll replace the roof. We'll put in new driveways and uh, and, and basically clean up the property. So mm-hmm. we we invest money in every property. But so in answer to your question, that's 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 where we're finding these. The the other the other source of seller. Uh, and I don't know why this is, but sometimes 
in the multifamily space, because it's so hard to find yield in multifamily right now, they'll go into the multi-tenant industrial market, but they don't understand how to manage it. These Mm -hmm. assets are very management intense, and they typically do not understand that leasing, that uh, tenant improvements and leasing commissions are real cost, and you better have an Argus software system to tell Mm -hmm. you what they should be. So, so they'll go in, they won't have enough money in reserves to pay for those tenant improvements and leasing commissions, and they run into trouble right about the second year and third year. Got it. So we're more than happy to come along and, and take this take this off their hands, and yeah. then they go back to multi. Yeah, the, yeah, the, knight, the knight in shining armor <laughs> coming on in. Yeah, so, we're, we're, yeah. How about any term defaults that, uh, you know, of, of debt that was originated back in 2006, 2007, 2008 range? Uh, well, not, not really 2008, but, you know, between 2005 and 2007. Are you finding any opportunities there at this point in time? You know, not not really. And I'm not saying they don't exist, but when you're looking in – really strong markets like we are with infill locations. If a project still has a lot of problems that maybe caused an original default, at this point in the cycle, we don't think we could fix them. Got it. Okay. And Makes why sense. you know, why not just stay with our you know, with our mission of stabilized and current yield mm-hmm. and emitting our rather than take any kind of value add risk to try to get a little bit higher IRR but sacrifice current income and just take a lot of leasing risk. Yep, that makes sense. Okay. How about the, you mentioned the management side of it is it's pretty management intensive, whereas a lot of people, they you, you throw out triple net, a lot of people just automatically define triple net type investments as very hands-off passive type of management properties. And so it sounds like that's completely the opposite of the truth here um, in this particular niche. So can you speak to the, the management side of the business and do you guys have an internal infrastructure Structure built for your property management company, or is there the luxury, like in the multifamily space, of of outsourcing it to very competent third party management companies? So, uh, in answer to your question, there are management intents. Uh, okay, so what we have found is that once uh, we we do, we do use third party property manage, managers in certain markets until we accumulate at least two hundred to three hundred thousand square feet of space Mm -hmm. so properties that we have in tampa atlanta columbus uh we have our own boots in the ground and we find that really is an advantage when you're dealing with these types of businesses and by the way 30 percent of our tenants are fortune 100 companies cvs general dynamics subaru but you know about 70 percent would be smaller businesses well, when you have your own boots on the ground, your own leasing people, you know, you need to know everybody. You know, what are they thinking? Who's having a baby? Whose birthday is it? Mm-hmm. It really, and you need to know what each of their business strategies are because you need to know who's looking for more space, who may be downsizing, how you could change the configurations. So the more uh, hands on you are in management, uh, the better that is. So we do have asset managers, and we do have boots on the ground property and leasing managers. We also do all of our accounting in house, uh, because we find that you know we're very that that really lets us control the funds much better and have mm-hmm. controls on expenses. We do uh, all our business with Bank America in their cash pro system. All of our tenants, hundreds and hundreds of tenants all over the country send their monthly rent checks directly to a lockbox at Bank America. Hmm. So we we monitor the cash, and every year uh, we have uh, we have audited uh, gap uh, audits done. Got it, got it. Okay. Now, now, some people ask why we do that, because we, we're not really required to have a, a gap audit. Uh, but we just like to know that everything that we're doing is not only transparent, uh, and and every dollar is where it should be. But at some point, we're looking to either exit in a large portfolio sale to an institutional investor, or form a public REIT. Okay, Got and it. that's really important. 
Yep. So that kind of takes me, it leads me into the next question is what is, what is the long-term plan for Avastone? And uh, I'm not sure if you guys typically, you know, uh, do deal specific um, uh, capital raises for, for the deals or if, if you have a, a, a fund that you have put together. I'm not sure if you have your exact back end structure, but overall, what is the long-term plan for the company and its portfolio? Well, every every we, we do have a fund. Uh, it's a small fund. Uh, we bought four properties in that fund. But, you know, going forward, we just do what's called Reg D offerings, so single mm-hmm. asset offerings. Gotcha. You know, we uh, just closed on CityGate in Columbus. You know, that was a standalone transaction that we that we funded with uh, Wall Street money and investor capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but from a long term standpoint, uh, we see the real value add. Uh, is is when you have like properties in a portfolio and you start to get to 200 million, 300 million, a billion of like kind properties, uh, you start to have economies of scale in execution Mm -hmm. in portfolio sales. So it's really important that in any one project that we buy, we do not necessarily assume nor model that we're going to have cap rate compression. If we're buying at an A cap, we're going to assume we sell it at an A cap. Yeah. When I was a lender, I used to hate general partners that would show this cap rate compression and they're going to make all this money. Mm, pie in the sky, like, right? What, <laughs> yeah, what the heck can they base it on, right? Yeah, yeah. But now, having said that, we do know that when you're aggregating up hundreds of millions of dollars of like kind properties in dynamic markets, there is institutional buyers that will buy a hundred million or five hundred million of assets, or you know possibly you you know you list a public REIT. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we so we explore that now. Doing that uh, potentially, you can see a lot of cap rate compression. Sure, but we don't automatically assume that. But everything we do, everything we buy, is with that goal in mind. And right now, we probably have one hundred and seventy million worth of uh, property value. So after this year, we'll be, you know, well north of, uh, you know, we hope, we hope to be well north of, you know, 200 million, maybe even 300 million. So, so when you have that kind of strategy, every single property in your portfolio becomes worth more if it's part of a portfolio. Mm-hmm. Nope, absolutely. So that, that's, yeah. Now, having said that, what we're starting to see now in certain markets, and I think Dallas is a good example, some of the markets that we're in uh, have had significant cap rate compression already. So we may be looking to take some profits in some of these markets just because it's a good time to do it. It's, it's, a, re, it's a bull market right now in this type mm-hmm. of product. The thing I've learned over the years, you can't call tops and you can't call bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> and what you need to do is you need to sell into strength. Mm-hmm. So, so this year we, we most likely will – uh, sell into some strength. In other words, if we can't buy in a market like Dallas right now, because we can't, we're priced out of it, then maybe it's time for us to sell in that market. Mm-hmm. No, you make, you make a great point. So that every market's so specific and so different from the other, but let's, let's talk about Dallas for a second. I mean, realistically, and, and I know none of us have a magic wand, but if, if you had to uh, place a bet on where we're at in, in the actual market cycle of, let's say, a Dallas, um, where would you say we're at? Are we in the, the the third inning, the seventh inning? Are we near in the ninth inning? I mean, just your best guess if you had to throw it out there. And I won't hold you to it. Okay. Okay. My best guess, generally speaking, because I go to all the all the conferences and mm-hmm. everybody asks that same question, right? So it's a good question. I think we're in the seventh inning of a doubleheader. Got it. Got it. First game, seventh inning. That's of a, a great answer. <laughs> I like that. It's the first time I've you know, heard that one. <laughs> it's interesting. I went to I went to a conference uh, recently. It was on non traded REITs, non 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 listed REITs. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the economists said, you know, the longest uh, recovery in modern history in a democracy was in Australia, and the recovery went for twenty eight years. Wow. I know. Wow, and and, so, and, we're, and we're technically what and, into our recovery eight years? I mean, I, I don't know when, yeah, when they actually base seven, is it. Two thousand ten is that when they truly base the start of it, or is it earlier? I would say so. That yeah. was, nah, it's probably as good as any. Yeah, you know, two thousand eight to two thousand ten was really a bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, when I look at the industrial space, 
And I see so many factors that are favoring this space and the fact that they aren't building any more of this. Mm -hmm. Well, in the words of a Wall Street uh, hedge fund uh, manager that I was listening to recently, I think he said it best. He said, they asked him what kept him up at night. And he said, what keeps me up at night is I really don't know what to be worried about. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, yeah. So, so again, I think, you know, I don't see Internet slowing down. I don't see robotics. I see that. I see so many continuing trends right now. Uh, and the key is to be in an asset type, whether they're mobile home parks or, or flex industrial, that they're really, really high barriers to creating any new product for yep. people yep. I mean, to so, go into. So, so what do you think, if you had to pick whatever the, the biggest risk is of, of your business, um, of the industrial space, what would that biggest risk be? And what are you guys doing to actively mitigate that risk? I mean, if, if you just had okay, to pick, so and, and there's risk in everything, but let's yeah. just, you tell me what the biggest one is sure. in your eyes. I think the biggest risk we face that will happen uh, is rising interest rates. Uh-huh. You know, you can't have a four to f- the even 5% growth economy, which I think we could have, without rising interest rates. Mm-hmm. That's what happens. So that's why we continue to lock in as low a rate as possible for 10 years. Mm-hmm. But what happens in a rising rate environment is, you know, theoretically, cap rates should go up, but sellers don't get that message right away. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so so what happens is you start to get pinched in your arbitrage. Mm-hmm. You know, the cap rates are still say eight percent, seven and a half, eight percent, and now all of a sudden, you know, whereas you could get a four and a half percent mortgage, now it's five percent. So you're going to start to, I think you're we're going to start to see some pressure uh, on that on that arbitrage. Now, but one of the reasons why we've locked in these high rates again, it goes back to it's a way that we hedge because a new buyer could buy that low interest rate. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, where I think the market is self-writing in a sense is that when you do get into the 3 to 4% growth, it puts a lot of pressure on rents. So, yes, we will pay more money with higher interest rates and financing costs, but I believe that our original assumptions on rental increase rates are going to be too conservative. I think we're going to see higher hmm. um rental rates. As the economy, you know, starts to hum, businesses are trying to grow, they can't find anywhere to go. Interesting. Okay. That, yeah. And I also see, you know, with unemployment as low as, as it is right now, I, start, I think we're going to start to see real growth uh, in personal income, which has been stagnant for mm-hmm. a decade. No, I, I agree with you. There's, there's, yeah. So, you know, again, there's so many, that's why it's, it's hard to see where this ends. Yeah. And again, I'll also say that you know the economy is no longer a monolithic whole, mm-hmm. like it, like it was in economics when I was in college. <laughs> now, you know the oil market's hot. High tech is not. High tech's hot. The oil market's not. There's so many different global cycles in different industries mm-hmm. that. I'm not sure the whole economy gets a recession at the same time anymore. Yeah, I agree with you on that. No, I, th- I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. Which is uh, which is great for us real estate investors, right? Especially the asset classes that you and I are both in, um, in their own right. <clears throat> so, well, fantastic. Well, well, Richard, this is, uh, and I know we're running out of time here, so I'm going to be respectful of, of your time. Um, I, have, I have two other questions I, I really am dying to ask you, and it, it's questions that I like to ask every one of the guests that come on the show. And uh, the fir- the first one being, you know, you've been in this game, both sides of the coin. Um, from you know, the capital market side to the uh, to, to the investment side, and so you've seen everything, right? You've been doing this quite some time. If you could go back, uh, knowing what you know today, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice back when you were first, I guess maybe diving into the investment side of things, what would that advice be? Well, the first thing I would say to anybody in any industry is you you need to hone your skills, no matter what you do. If you're a programmer. You just hone your skills. Uh, if you're in this industry, depending on what side of the shop you're on, if you're on acquisitions, hone your skills on, on income dynamics of, of commercial properties. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're in financing, hone your skills on credit. Because in a really shifting economy, that's what you have to sell to the market is your skill base. Mm-hmm. And you need to be better at it than anybody else and just do your best. Um, 
So in looking back, if I were to do anything different, well, I would say that maybe I wouldn't do anything different because mm-hmm. I, it worked out well. Yeah. Fair and nice. every, every difficult uh, challenge, I learned something. Mm-hmm. And everything that I do today is based on those lessons that I've learned over being in this business for, you know, 30 to 40 years. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So, and, and you can't learn those things unless you learn them the hard way. Half that's the time. it with mistakes. Right? So I'm not that's sure. It. I'm not sure I change anything. I, I really like where no, Abstone's at today and where I'm at. That's a great answer. If you're not making mistakes, you're not growing, <laughs> right? That's right. That's yeah. how you learn not to make mistakes. Yeah, you actually yeah. go out and make mistakes. You know, and you, and you make a point about you know honing your craft or honing your skill set uh, and becoming the best at it. I mean, I, I, you guys have chosen industrial parks. We choose mobile home parks and and we try to be the best at it we, we have a very intense focus as it sounds like you guys do as well in avistone and um I, I see that as being one of the big mistakes that a lot of uh guys make no matter what path they, they decide they deviate whether they deviate too soon or they deviate simultaneously and they, and they try to put their finger in too many baskets and not that um you know many can't do really well and, and multi-focus but um I, I think that there's a lot more stability in choosing one focus, one directed focus, and putting all your efforts forth versus dissecting that in multiple different paths and, 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 and again, putting your fingers in a lot of different baskets. So I'm not, it sounds like you yeah, probably agree. agree. Yeah. And, I do. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Richard, now we're ending the show. We're going to round it out now. And uh, I like to enter what I like to call the golden nuggets segment of the show. And this is where I'm going to ask you, and you've given us a lot of golden nuggets already. So I hope you have a couple more left in your pocket you'd like to share. Uh, but I'm only going to ask for one of them so you can keep the rest for another time. <laughs> if you had just one final golden nugget of advice or wisdom left over to leave with our listeners today, to share with our listeners that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their real estate investing career, what would that one last final golden nugget be? You know, somebody once told me, that markets do whatever they have to do to prove the most number of people wrong. Hmm. So what that means is, is that things are never as good or, or bad as people think they are. When everybody's pessimistic, pessimistic, you're at the bottom of, of a market. When everybody is optimistic, you're at the top of a market. Mm-hmm. So you have to really kind of stand back from what the crowd is thinking and just stick to your discipline. Mm-hmm. When you start to get into really really strong markets like we're in right now, pull back a little bit. Don't leverage it as high. Mm-hmm. Start to, to marshal more cash. So just understand that everything is cyclical, and when everybody is talking about being bullish or being bearish, then you may be at a turning point. Yep. No, gr- great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that, Richard. And um this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. I know I've learned a ton. I know our listeners have as well. And um, again, I had mentioned this is a uh, an asset class I have not had an expert on the show uh, speak about. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and, and share this information with us. And for those that are uh, that are tuning in, if you want to learn more about Richard and his company, you can go visit him at avistone.com. That's A V I S T O N E. Again, avistone.com. And Richard, that's all we have for today, my friend. Um, really appreciate you coming on, and uh, I wish you the best success in everything you, you do. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully staying in touch and talking to you again. Great. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning. We'll be right back. 